Howdy and welcome back to Monster Watch. Today we're looking at the horrific story of the Nepropetrovsk maniacs, a case that shocked not just Ukraine but the entire world. If you find this sort of content interesting, then hit the like button and consider subscribing. It's the summer of 2007 in Dnepropetrovsk, Ukraine. The country is recovering after a period of political upheaval. But things are settling down, and people are enjoying the warm weather. Then they started to find battered bodies around the city and neighboring towns. Two young men, Viktor Sayenko and Igor Sapronyuk, were on a brutal spree that would claim at least 21 lives. To understand their heinous acts and how they got to this point, we need to start with their childhoods. Viktor Sayenko and Igor Sapronyuk were both born in 1988, with Igor born on April 20th, sharing his birthday with a certain German dictator, a fact that seemed to make Igor proud. Growing up, they appeared to be normal kids, but by their teenage years, they began displaying disturbing behaviors. They had met in school and formed a friendship with another boy named Alexander Hansa. At around 14, they decided that they needed to get over their fears by facing them head on. Sapronyuk and Sayenko were afraid of heights, so they would hang off the balcony of a 14th floor apartment. When this seemed to ease their acrophobia, they began to see what else they could do. This is where they went from stupid to evil. Alexander Hansa was afraid of blood, and he had a kitten that he was terrified he would accidentally hurt. Somehow, Sapronya came to the conclusion that the way to get over this would be to actually hurt animals. The boys would go after stray dogs and cats that they could find around their neighborhood, then photograph themselves posing with the bodies after they had done horrible things to them. In some of these pictures, they would draw National Socialist imagery in the animal's blood. Three years after the boys had started this bizarre series of experiments, they started to victimize people. Sapronyuk and Sayanka were soon arrested for stealing a bike, but they were not incarcerated because they were still minors. There are also reports of fairly brutal attacks and robberies against classmates. After they left school, the three would look for work, with Sapronyuk using his car to act as an illegal taxi, sort of a precursor to Uber. He had been given the car by his parents, which set him apart from much of his peer group. It is said that his dad was a pilot with connections in the government. Sapronyuk would soon realize that every passenger was an opportunity to get some cash and recruited Sayanko and Hansa to begin robbing them. But Alexander Hansa backed out as Igor and Victor began escalating their crimes and violence. Several of their robbery victims had been severely beaten, and at least one was recorded. It was the robbery of a 70-year-old woman who would lose sight in one eye and several teeth in the incident. Skipping forward to 2007, in the spring there was severe political turmoil as the president dissolved parliament, then held special elections to replace them. Meanwhile, in Dnepropetrovsk, Igor Sapronyuk and Viktor Sayanko had moved past robberies and assault and began massacring people at random. On the night of June 24th, they took the life of their first known victim, 23-year-old Vadim Bogdan, who was a government employee, possibly a policeman. He was bludgeoned in the town of Kurilovka after accepting a ride from Sapronyuk. There was also a homicide on March 3rd that may have been part of the spree. That of 61-year-old Viktor Gadinok, who had been traveling along the highway between Nepropetrovsk and Novomoskovsk. There were also a few other homicides around this time that are possibly connected. However, after Bogdan, the spree truly began and the attacks came rapidly. The next day, three people were attacked, two of whom did not survive. Yekaterina Ilchenko, a 33-year-old mother, was walking home from a friend's house in the Kaminar housing estate. Sapronyuk had a hammer with him, and as he and Sayanko passed her on the sidewalk, he whirled around and attacked from behind, bludgeoning her. Her body would remain undiscovered until early the next morning by her own mother. Just an hour later, they struck again ending the life of 35-year-old Roman Tatarovich with a series of hammer blows to the head. He had been asleep on a bench outside a prosecutor's office located just a few minutes from the first crime scene. The attack had been so severe that his skull was shattered, and when he was found shortly after Yekaterina, he could not be identified by appearance. That night, a 58-year-old man named Viktor Pertsev was also beaten, but luckily he survived. These senseless homicides were just the beginning of a horrific spree. 
Over the next few weeks, Victor and Igor's crimes continued to escalate. On June 28, the pair ambushed 69-year-old Alexei Kovbasa. This would become their most infamous crime. The whole thing was filmed, and later the video was leaked to the internet. Many articles claim that the video depicts the July 12th victim, Sergei Yatsenko. However, Yatsenko was riding a motorcycle while Kovbasa was ambushed while riding his bicycle through a wooded area, which is what the video depicts. Sopronyuk and Sayanko filmed the entire 8-minute ordeal, including the moment they smashed him off his bike with a hammer concealed in a plastic bag, showing a disturbing lack of remorse as they laughed and taunted their victim. Their brutality was extreme. The pair used a hammer to knock him off his bike, then dragged him into the woods and used a screwdriver to stab at his abdomen, before finally smashing his head once again with the hammer. This prolonged torture was all caught on camera, as was Sayanko and Sopronyuk's laughter. Though it is theorized that many of their attacks were filmed, this is the only one that was leaked to the public. Mr. Kovbasa's body was left in the woods to be found days later. July 1st saw the tragic deaths of high school student Yevgenia Grishenko and a 56-year-old man named Nikolai Serchuk in the town of Novomoskovsk. Grishenko had been walking with a friend who managed to escape, while Serchuk lost his life near his home. Both victims fit the maniac's pattern in brutal methods. On July 6th, the terror continued. A 21-year-old army recruit named Egor Nokovoloda was attacked as he walked home from a club and was found the next morning by his mother just outside their home. Around the corner from where Egor's body was found, a security guard named Yelena Shram was found battered and broken. Her own sweater had been used to wipe blood from the blunt instrument she had been struck by. They did not stop at two that night and another woman was found massacred. Valentina Hanza was a mother of three. Every victim was met with a blitz attack. Sopronyuk and Sayanka would approach them with a hammer concealed from view. The very next day, they attacked two boys who were riding their bikes to go fishing. One was able to escape, but Andrei Sidyuk was not so lucky. His friend, Vadim Lyakov, was initially arrested. Despite aggressive interrogation techniques, the boy refused to confess to having anything to do with the attack on his friend. Once investigators were satisfied of his innocence, they at last saw a pattern in the brutal crimes. Finally, they connected the series of bludgeonings and realized that one or one pair of suspects was behind the slew of homicides. Prior to this, police had strongly asserted that the homicides in the area had been isolated incidents. Lyakov was able to give them a description of the two men who had ran up on him and his friend. This description was added to the case file as police began cross-referencing the evidence on the prolific monsters that they sought. On July 14th, Sopronyuk and Sayanko would repeat the procedure that they had used on Mr. Kovbasa. This time it was 48-year-old Sergei Yatsenko who was unlucky enough to ride past the pair on his motorcycle. His battered remains would be found four days later in the woods just off the side of the road that he had been traveling on. To add a final act of disrespect, Sayanko and Sopronyuk would also attend some victims' funerals and can be seen flipping the bird to gravestones in the collection of photos that police confiscated. Around the same time as the Yatsenko homicide, they also took the life of a 45-year-old woman named Natalia Memarchuk. She was cycling home through a wooded area in the city of Diovka when she was knocked off her bike and beaten with a hammer and a metal bar. Once again, there were witnesses. Two kids who had been camping nearby saw the homicide, and the description that they would give police closely resembled that given to them by Lyakov. In response to the vicious series of homicides, a special team was sent from Kiev. For some reason, most of the investigation was kept secret, and no official files have been released to the public. This is possibly a vestige from the days that Ukraine was under Soviet control. The USSR downplayed an obscured serial homicide, they claim that such crimes were a result of the decadence of capitalism and did their best to hide any evidence to the contrary. This is one of the reasons that identities of many of the victims are unknown, but it also makes the leak of the Kovbasa video even more horrible. The authorities couldn't let the public know all the specifics of the crime spree and investigation, yet one of them was willing to release one of the most brutal videos that the internet has ever seen. The video first showed up on a shock site, but was shared and spread throughout the internet, shocking the world. It's bizarre to me that these sort of videos are allowed online with no penalty for the websites that host them. It's highly disrespectful to the victims and their families. Their spree would continue until July 23, 2007, when the pair was finally arrested. 
They were caught when Sopranya tried to sell a mobile phone stolen from one of their victims for less than $30. When the pawn shop owner did the usual check with police, the phone came back to a homicide victim. What the police found on that phone sealed the pair's fate, disturbing videos and photos documenting their crimes. Hansa was also arrested and can be seen in the court photographs alongside Sopranyuk and Sayanko. One of the most disturbing theories about these crimes is that they were recording the homicides to sell as snuff videos. Snuff videos are films that depict actual homicides for the entertainment of viewers. This theory arose because of the way that they meticulously recorded their crimes, showing no fear of being caught. A classmate would also report that Igor had bragged about being paid for a special video he was making to his friend. But this information is coming third hand. However, it is true that investigators believe that they might have been part of an underground network that sold this sort of horrific content. Their trial started on June 24, 2008, and it was one of the most followed cases in Ukraine. Sopronyuk was charged with 21 homicides, 8 robberies, and 1 count of animal cruelty. Syanka was charged with 18 homicides, 5 robberies, and 1 count of animal cruelty as well. Their old friend Alexander Hanzo was charged with 2 counts of armed robbery. All three would confess quickly after their arrest, though Sopronyuk would try to withdraw his. The lawyer for the victim's family, Larissa Dovgal, went after the prosecution, saying that there were many additional homicides that were not included and that there should be at least five defendants on trial, not three. Sopronyuk's lawyer made an attempt to argue that his client was insane, and when that did not work, he resigned and a replacement was appointed. Hansa and Sayanko pled guilty, though their lawyers alleged improper police and interrogation procedures in an attempt to get the evidence thrown out. These efforts failed, as did the claim by Sayanko's dad, an influential lawyer, that his son had been psychologically dependent on Sopronyuk and had been led down a dark path unwillingly. Though this claim was made at the same time that he was arguing his son was innocent of the spree of homicides anyway. The evidence was overwhelming and the defense seemed desperate. Despite hundreds of videos and photographs chronicling the young men's descent into violence and homicide, they attempted to claim that the people in the photos and videos were not in fact the defendants. At the time, it would have been near impossible to edit the videos to frame Sopronyuk and Sayanko this way, but now, with AI video generation, it becomes easier every day. The defense lawyers claimed that the real culprits were allowed to walk free due to power and influence, which might be the same people who the victim's lawyer said should also be on trial. They were finally convicted on February 11, 2009. Sopronyuk and Sayanka would both be given life sentences, while Alexander Hansa was given nine years in prison. Based on his statements, he seems to be both disgusted and terrified of his former friends. Essentially, he said that if he had any idea what they had been doing, he would have never gone near them. Sopronyuk and Sayanka would appeal the conviction in August of 2009. Somehow, despite the evidence, the maniac's family still claimed that they were innocent. However, it was not successful, and on November 24, 2009, the sentences for Sayanko and Sopronyuk were upheld. Alexander Hansa was released in 2019 and is said to have a wife and two children. The victim's families are still dealing with the devastation these two psychopaths created, and experts have tried to understand what drove Victor and Igor to such extreme measures, but the answers remain unclear. It seems like a mix of boredom, a desire for fame, and a complete lack of empathy played a role.